So for the past few weeks, we've been about to have an essentials class on church membership, but for various reasons that hasn't happened. And it now happens that well, we're going to have a combined class this morning and we're going to talk about church membership. Um, partly, I, I, I'm... Uh, intending here to uh, maybe do some preventive maintenance, uh, go through some uh, reminders uh, for many of you, for some of you, some of the things that we may cover this morning will be new information. Um, but we've had a couple of situations recently, and really over the years, um, uh, I think some of the difficulties that uh, people have um, experienced or gotten themselves into um, partly were a function of not having a right and biblical understanding of the church and of church membership. Um, and you know, so some of those things happened very recently, and and it just seemed like a good opportunity to um, talk to the whole church, the whole uh, Sunday school. I know some of it's be like preaching to the choir to some of you, but um, I hope it'll be helpful. And part of what we're going to focus on is loyalty. Um, Loyalty to the local church. Loyalty uh, is defined as a strong feeling of support or allegiance. And we believe that the Bible teaches that your local church, this church, is to have preeminence in your life. It is to be so central that major decisions about where you live, the work you do, and many other priorities and responsibilities revolve around your church life and not the other way around. And we know that this is countercultural even within Christian circles. Um, but that's why we're going to spend some time on it. One of the things that I'll refer to uh, throughout the lesson is this book by Peter Masters, um, Church Membership in the Bible. Peter Masters is a name that you may be familiar with. It's on our confession. He's, he's the one who edited this version of our confession. And... Um, He has a number of, of really good um, points that he makes in this book, but he's got a whole chapter on loyalty. And so we'll, we'll, we'll be moving in that direction. Um, the, the plan is for uh, us to first take a, a look at some of the paragraphs in the confession that speak to church membership. Uh, then we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 12, um, and go through verses 12 to 27 and what they say about how the church has been designed uh, by God and how you have been made to fit into it. Um, and then we'll take from that um, some of the applications that Peter Masters has in his book. So, um, if you've got your 1689, turn with me there to chapter 26. Um, if, if you don't have one, you, you might 
not be aware that there's an app in the Play Store that is the 1689 that you because you can have it everywhere you go. And we have it on the church app too. I forgot about that. Um, but so in the 1689, the, the chapter on the church, in paragraph 5, I'm going to look at paragraphs 5, 6, 7, 12, and 13. Just a kind of a quick overview um, by way of reminder. But it, you know, it's, good to, it's good to be reminded of these things. So in chapter... In chapter 26, paragraph 5, In the exercise of the authority which has been entrusted to him, the Lord Jesus calls to himself from out of the world, through the ministry of his word, by his spirit, those who are given to him by his Father, so that they may walk before him in all the ways of obedience which he prescribes to them in his word. Those who are thus called, he commands to walk together in particular societies or churches for their mutual edification and for the due performance of that public worship which he requires of them in the world. The texts that um, su support these points are, are noted there. We're not going to go through all of them, but And there are others besides these that are mentioned that could, could be quoted in support of this doctrinal position. Um, but I'll, I'll draw your attention specifically in this one to um, Matthew 18, 15 to 20, which we know to be that um, passage on church discipline we refer to it as church discipline. Um, it's really just about how we are to conduct ourselves together. Um, the, 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 it's, you know, when I first um, considered the, the, the fact that this passage on church discipline is the like central to um, our understanding of the necessity of church membership, I was kind of shocked by it. You know that that, that would be the thing that um, the confession would specifically mention. But um, you know, it spells out the the ways that we are to um, interact with each other. Um, and, and, and to preserve the unity among us, to preserve the purity of the church. And um, you can't do those things that are spelled out in that passage apart from being in a church. And, and so that's the, really the issue. You, you, you can't live out that kind of... Um, uh, commitment to each other, um, accountability toward each other, uh, unity uh, uh, with each other, apart from being committed to a local church. So then chapter, uh, uh, paragraph 6, the members of these churches are saints because they have been called by Christ and because they visibly manifest and give evidence of their obedience to that call by their profession and walk. Such saints willingly consent to walk together according to the appointment of Christ, giving themselves up to the Lord and to one another according to God's will in avowed subjection to the ordinances of the gospel. So we are willingly consenting to walk together um, but we've been called to do that by Christ. It is, um, you know, he has prescribed the ways that he wants his worship to be done. And um, part of that, you know, the reference here, in avowed subjection to the ordinances of the gospel. Um, 
so we can't just sort of wing it and do it however we wish. Um, we are it's an issue of obedience really the, the issue of you know committing yourself to a local church body one of the passages there in, the, in support of that section is acts 2 41 and 42 um, where we have the history of the first church um, how they conducted themselves let's look at that Acts 2, 41 and 42. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. One of the things we see here is that the, um, the ordinance of baptism, the ordinance of breaking of bread, um, but the adding to their number so that there was a defined and specific number of people who were the church. So there were some who were the church, and then there were others who were not the church. But there was a defined group. And so that speaks to our responsibility um, to commit ourselves to a local body. Paragraph 7, to each of these churches thus gathered, according to the Lord's mind as declared in his word, he has given all the power and authority which is in any way required for them to carry on the order of worship and discipline which he has instituted for them to observe. He has also given them all the commands and rules for the due and right exercise of this power. Um, and so this is a Baptist distinctive. Um, we have, well, in, in Master's explanatory note there, he says, because all the power and authority which is in any way required is given to local churches, there is no function left for synods, councils, annual assemblies, area superintendents, Episcopal bishops, general secretaries, or any other kind of denominational authority. The Lord directly and personally governs and empowers local churches, which are humanly autonomous, independent, and self-governing. This article also affirms that the New Testament provides a clear pattern for all the legitimate activities and governments of the Lord's churches, a fact disregarded by so many. So every Baptist church is an independent, Christ is the head of the church, and every Baptist church operates independently. Um, there are all manner of variations of you know, what that looks like. I saw once a, a history of all of the Baptist denominations, and it was like the spider web of, you know, different churches breaking off in different directions over, you know, specific uh, uh, doctrinal issues, but um, all Baptist uh, nonetheless. Um, paragraph 12. All believers are bound to join themselves to particular churches when and where they have opportunity to do so. And all who are admitted into the privileges of a church are also under the censures and government of that church in, accord in accordance with the rule of Christ. So, so your commitment to... Uh, this church uh, includes um, submission 
to really each other, uh, to elders and especially to the Lord. And that, uh, you know, it, it, so it's a truth that we will all generally, uh, you know, nod our heads and agree um, until someone counsels you in a way that you don't want to hear. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, beware of your own rebellion. Uh, it is, it is, it is really, uh, I, I, won't, I won't say every case, but in, in most cases where someone has left the church and it has been an, an, an unpleasant, you know, parting, um, uh, the, there's been a rebellion of some kind, you know, just, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to take that counsel, I'm not going to um, submit to your leadership. Um, but your, your membership calls, your, your, your commitment to the church, your, your status as a member calls you to do that. Uh, and um, you know we're we're all rebels by nature. Um, we need to be um, trained, you know. Uh, we need to be changed, really, so that we are able to um, submit to uh, to each other. Um, the, uh, the, then uh, paragraph 13, no church members, because of any offense which has been given them by a fellow member, once they have performed their prescribed duty towards the person who has caused the offense, may disturb church order in any way or be absent from the meetings of the church or the administration of any ordinances on account of such offense. On the contrary, they are to wait upon Christ in the further proceedings of the church. So, <laughs> you know, when someone says, well, um, I'm going to withdraw my membership. Uh, sometimes we say, no, you're not. Um, that's not... A, you know, it's a, it's not that in every case that's not right. There are there are legitimate reasons why you might leave. Uh, I, you know, principally if you had a uh, significant change in your understanding of what the Bible teaches regarding church government, for example, you may decide that um, you need to be in a church that. Um, Um, agrees with your new conviction on that issue. But um, s simply to withdraw it, you know, just to say, well, I, I disagree with, you know, your, your, the counsel you're giving me, and so I'm leaving. Um, that's really not an option for you once you're a member of the church. Um, we you know we're not, obviously we, we can't physically restrain you we're not going to do that but uh, it does speak to the um, uh, peace that you have with your brothers um, it does have some bearing on whether we would um, you know recommend to another church that you that 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 you be accepted as a member if you've left here on bad terms you're called to make things right. Um, so there are, you know, we have had, it's, it's kind of rare, but, but, but sometimes we do get calls from um, 
pastors at other churches who will say, you know, so and so is visiting here, and and I, I need to know, the, you know, how, what the status was when they left, and you know, um, do you commend them to us? Um, that's the exception. Most of the time, it seems, at least it's been our experience, that um, they're so loosely structured, so, so um, really careless uh, about um, the way that they shepherd their flocks that um, it's not even a part of the discussion. Uh, welcome, welcome, come on in, you know. Uh, oh, you were disfellowship, don't worry about it. Um, so that's been, um, you know, our experience primarily. But so, so there's just a brief, uh, you know, a reminder of some of the key paragraphs in the confession. Uh, it, uh, I wanted to go through those just as, as sort of a way of setting the table for what we're going to talk about. Did I hear a question? Um, so with that, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 12. And let's look at verses 12 to 27. This is one, one of many metaphors that we see in the Bible for the church. Uh, we'll look at more briefly at some of the others, but we wanted to. I wanted to spend a good bit of time on this one. Um, this chapter starts with uh, a discussion of uh, spiritual gifts, and um, it's an important uh, thing to. To think through, I, I don't w- want to take the time to do that now, except to say that when you're indwelt by the Spirit of God, you are given spiritual gifts, and um, you need to exercise them. <laughs> um, they're given to you for the edification of the church. Um, Paul in writing to the Corinthians is addressing in 12, 13, and 14 um, a wrong view that some in the church had taken of those gifts, um, which persists even today in many churches um, um, where people will sort of glorify themselves by drawing attention to themselves and their particular giftedness. Um, and sometimes those are not even really true spiritual gifts. They're demonic, um, I don't know, somethings, manifestations. Um, but then he gets into uh, this section 12 to 27, so let's just read that. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Well, I'm going to go back to uh, get just a brief commentary on some of the issues that are raised in each of these verses, but I just want to read through it first. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have been, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. That's a particularly important verse that we're going to come back to and spend a good bit of time on. 
And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. So, um, much of Peter Master's book on church membership focuses on this passage. And um, that's why I wanted to spend a good bit of time on it before we go to read some of the com- some of his commentary on church membership and loyalty to the church. Um, but so let's just go back in verse 12. Um, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Um, uh, Hodge, uh, Charles Hodge, wrote a a commentary that's well regarded on 1 Corinthians. And I'm going to share with you some of the things that he said about this passage. Um... And in particular here, he he understands that so also is Christ uh, to be the body of Christ or the church. Um, And unless the body consisted of many members, it would not be an organic whole. Uh, The body of Christ would not be an organic whole unless it consisted of many members. It seems kind of an obvious point, um, but uh, you know, part of what needs to be considered is that each one of those members comes with different gifts, different abilities. Um, I, was, I was listening to a sermon David Murray uh, preached on, on this section, and uh, you know, at one point he said, no one can do what you can do. Like there's no one else in all the world who has been designed in just the way that you have been designed and um, your particular constitution um, is essential to this church. You, you, you were given gifts, and God put you here to use them. Um, it's, it's easy to just sort of forget that. Uh, this this um, world that we live in, you know, views uh, church really is kind of a commodity. Um, And I am guilty of having thought that way myself. Um, I know years ago I had sort of a uh, professional crisis. I got laid off, you know, and I'd been at this place for 10 years and and out of work and and it's like, "Ah," you know, what do you do? Uh, Well, I do. I did what, you know. You, you I guess uh, others in, in my position. My, I started sending resumes all over the country, you know, and I'm looking for work. Um, and it was the central concern of my life was, you know, how am I? What, what am I going to do for work? How am I going to? 
uh, pay my bills and, and and my mentality at the time was um, you know, it's just a matter of you know who's going to offer me the best job. <laughs> um, I don't know if Tom is here today. Yeah, Tom's over there. Tom was here then. Tom was, um, you know, hearing me pour out my heart about these things, and um, I got an offer to go to North Carolina, and I was telling Tom about this. And uh, actually, it was it was it was in in my hometown where uh, where I had worked before, where I had much family, um, but where I knew there wasn't a, a really good church. And and but I, without explaining all of that, Tom said, "Well, what are you going to do about church?" <laughs> um, and I didn't. Uh, I'm sure that what I said to him at the time was, well, I'm sure I'll find one. (laughs) Um, But, you know, and partly because he put that issue right in my face, uh, and uh, partly, I'm sure, because of the Spirit of God at work in me, you know, as the time got closer to, okay, you know, are you going to do this? Are you going to say yes and pack up and move and leave and um, all of this? I began to think, you know, I have been floundering around. I was 50 at the time. Um, I had been in three, I'd been a member of three other churches. First Baptist of Mount Airy, First Baptist of Jackson, Ohio, and First Baptist of Orlando. Uh, I would commend none of them to you. Uh, and but you know, here I was at Cornerstone, and I really, I just, you know, had found um, a true church, a, a body of believers, a. Um, you know, a group who was zealous in their evangelism, which I had not seen anywhere. <laughs> um, in fact, that's partly what drove me out of First Baptist of Orlando was their dismiss- dismissiveness toward it. Um, and I just finally, I just could, I just like, I can't leave. I just got to figure out something else to do. Um, and I'm so glad that that things worked out that way. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, the, you know, the Lord has has blessed that decision over and over and over. I can't tell you how many how many ways, how many times. Um, and, and this is an issue that Peter Masters addresses in this book, and in the section on loyalty to the church, he says. There's a section titled, Should the Believer Move? And he says, um, In normal circumstances, the believer's first thought must always be, God has called me to be loyal to my present community. Can I therefore be sure that it is his will that I should move? Am I really being called somewhere else? Is there clear evidence of his leading, supported by circumstantial guidance, and having taken account of the counsel of my brothers and sisters in the Lord? Um, You know, the day may come when you are laid off, (laughs) and your, your circumstances seem to be saying to you, well, you know, I, the only job I can get is in Houston, or I don't know, Tampa. Um, we're going to counsel you not to take it. Um, and this is what we're going to counsel you to do. Master says, One of the great assurances of the Christian life is that although we are frequently tried and tested by problems, often seemingly insurmountable ones, 
When we turn to God in prayer, He intervenes and helps us. The history of grace is a story of wonderful, often astounding provisions from the Lord. However, some believers, the moment a problem arises of the kind mentioned, assumed that it can be resolved only by uprooting and moving. They panic and see only radical solutions, and they do not seriously ask the Lord to provide for them so they can remain loyal to their church work. All this is very sad, with churches receiving heavy blows because members do not attempt to prove their Lord. It's good advice, isn't it? Um, so, like I said, this is partly preventive maintenance. Um, in verse 13 of chapter 12, um, we read, For by, by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. I, I think Hodge is using the King James here. Um, and the baptism here is of the spirit. Uh, there are others who argue that it is actual water baptism, but I agree with Hodge. I think we're talking here about being um, baptized into the Spirit, or, or being regenerated, being born again. And um, Hodge says, um, no matter how great may have been the previous difference, whether they were Jews or Gentiles, bond or free, by this baptism of the Spirit, all who experience it are merged into one body. They are all intimately and organically united as partaking of the same life. Um, And so you're, it's the, you're, you're baptized into the universal church, the, the believers everywhere. You, you're part of that body of believers worldwide. But your, uh, your, your membership, the way that you live that out, is in your local church. And so uh, when, we are, when we are brought together into this church, um, all worldly um, um, qualifications or characteristics or whatever, it doesn't, you know, um, all of that is, is secondary. It really, it doesn't matter your... Uh, ethnic background, your racial background, your socioeconomic background, your work life. And, 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 you know, we are, we are, we are baptized together into one body where we all have an equal um, status, I guess you would say, and um, before God. We, we all have a particular function. Um, um, that, that God has given us so that we can't, um, there's, there's no room for boasting in any of that. Uh, we, um, um, so all, all differences are, are set aside is, 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 is the issue here. Um, we're, we're united to Christ um, and we have fellowship in Christ um, verse 14 for the body is not one member but many 
Hodge says the church no more consists of persons all having the same gifts than the body is all eye or all ear, as the body is not one member but many, so the church is not one member but many. Um, Verses 15 and 16, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Um, Part of the issue here is, and, and Hodge says, the first and most obvious conclusion from the view which Paul had given of the nature of the church is the duty of contentment. So whatever your gift, whatever you have been called to do here um, is important. It may not be the most visible. It may be invisible. It may be that you are the prayer warrior Um, that's uh, as important, if not more important, than anything else that that would happen here. Um, And Hodge goes on to say, it is just as unreasonable and absurd for the foot to complain that it is not the hand as for one member of the church to complain that he is not another. So, um, on this subject of gifts, um, you may not know like what your gift is. Um, and my advice has been, do something. And if it goes well, then maybe that's your giftedness. And if it doesn't, try something else. Um, I I can't help but mention that um, at First Baptist, uh, they came up with this psychological profile. Like, you take this test and you answer 50 questions and they crunch all the numbers and they spit out your list of gifts. Um, (laughs) There may be something that you could learn from that process, but I don't, I think you just need to do something. You know, do something. Serve. That's what you're called to do. Um, uh, Hodge continues on, uh, he says, the obvious meaning of this verse, that the very existence of the body as an organization depends on the union of members endowed with different The obvious meaning of this verse is that the very existence of the body as an organization depends on the union of members endowed with different functions. And the application of this idea to the church is equally plain. It also requires to its existence a diversity of gifts and offices. If all were apostles, where would be the church? Um, And then verse 18. And I want to camp out here um, a good bit. But now God hath set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And this is where uh, Masters uh, drills down a bit. So I'm going to read you a couple of pages of this chapter on loyalty. And and this section of this chapter is called A Low or High View of the Church. What is the local church in our estimation? Is it merely a company of Christians conveniently gathered together for worship and instruction? Or is it something special in God's sight? Has God chosen its members, organized the distribution of gifts and abilities, and called those individuals to be committed to each other to serve him and to live as a unique family? Does God require a special loyalty within the local church? The New Testament is clear in its portrayal of the local church as a company of believers very strongly related 
together in bonds of love and loyalty and service. The local church is much greater than a haphazard collection of believers. It is a spiritually integrated family vested with unique privileges and authority to carry out the commands of its head, the Lord Jesus Christ. A local church is the object of his delight, and he is especially protective towards it. The local church, as Paul says repeatedly in 1 Corinthians 12, is one body. I think in this these verses 12 to 27, the word body is eight is used 18 times. And in the 18th verse, he says, Now God hath set members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. In other words, God has designed each congregation. Paul goes on to say, there should be no schism in the body. He then says that God has organized the distribution of capacities so that every member is of importance to the body. We therefore conclude that if any are removed other than by the design and overruling of the Lord, some vital quality will be missing. The members care and feel for one another to the extent that when one suffers, all the others suffer also. The congregation has a special place in the purposes of God. So, you know, we, we need to, like, uh, infuse this perspective uh, into our thinking that... You know, we, we, you know, we, we tend to, we tend to, you know, we just sort of live our lives and, you know, uh, things happen. What is that, that talking head song, uh, letting the days go by? Uh, how did I get here? Uh, it must be before your time. Um, that's right. <laughs> So that's this worldly thing, you know. But the the reality is that God has very deliberately, you know, uh, in His wisdom, uh, for His glory, brought you here. And don't take that lightly. That is... God at work in your life. Um, don't think like the world. Don't view the church as a commodity, you know. Um, that's the way unbelievers look at the church. What? You're 35 miles away? Well, that's way too far, you know. Um, we found a good church just around the corner. It meets on Saturday night so that it doesn't mess up our Sundays. Um, one of the points that Masters makes is that it's not just the body as a metaphor. There, Every metaphor that's used speaks to the um, critical function of each of its constituent parts. Um, he says in, in, in the second chapter of the book, um, which is the character of, of a local church, um, he has a section called Holy Committed Members. And he speaks about these different, some of the metaphors, and he says, the, total, uh, the principle of total wholehearted commitment to a church is not an isolated teaching in the New Testament because the church metaphors all stress this also. What kind of unity and integration exists in the body? It is highly coordinated, it is a highly coordinated structure in which eye and hand work together 
It is a picture of great unity and interdependence of the parts. The building illustration repeats the lesson, for the stones of the temple must be fitly framed together, interlocking closely so that the arches and vaults successfully support the building. Again, it is a picture of totally pooled effort and resources on the part of church members. The vine, also, the vine picture also shows the intended character of a New Testament church, for in John 15 we are taught that the very notion of dead, inactive branches is offensive to the Lord. The family illustration gives a picture of the local church as a community of thriving members exercising real mutual care and sharing the breadwinning chores and other aims of the household. Together, the church metaphors lay upon us an obligation to relate closely to each other in the total worship and work effort of our fellowship. To be withdrawn, aloof, reserved, lazy, complacent, or indifferent is a rejection of all the Lord's teaching on the subject. <laughs> you know, I, I, w w I read a couple of reviews of... Um, this book and this view uh, that Masters takes. And one of the things that, you know, was, was thrown at him was that, wow, he's a legalist. And um, I, 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 you know, I believe those people, the, they don't understand how God has designed the church, what he intends for us here, um, and it is for our good. Uh, it, he is uh, working in us and through us here. And um, I hope that uh, as you face various trials and difficulties in your life that um, your your perspective of the centrality of the church in your life will be informed by these things. Did you have a question? I'm having a hard time understanding how this connects, like, you know, like if you went from one biblical church to another biblical church and were all the body of Christ, how would that be like leaving the body? Are you saying that um, this means that each church in itself is its own body? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Um, so there, there, it's not, so I, I'm not saying that there is never a situation in which, you know, um, you, you, the circumstances in your life, uh, you know, r require you to move and go to another church. Um, there are good biblical churches in other places. Um, but, that needs to be those circumstances and, and the situation and the council. Um, the starting point uh, should be um, I'm a member of this church. Uh, my priority needs to be how can I can remain committed to this church? Um, and if it becomes impossible, well, then, you know, then you do something else. But um, the, I guess the is, one of the issues we're dealing with here is that um, simply because there's a better job somewhere is not a good reason to leave the church. Uh, simply because you're getting counsel you disagree with um, is not a reason to leave the church. Um, and, you know, those things happen often. And, and, and the church is sort of 
like this third or fourth or fifth tier consideration, and it shouldn't be. Any other questions or? Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, we are um, so grateful for uh, this church and um, your kindness toward us and bringing us here uh, for the um, fellowship that we have for um, just this body of believers who are um, seeking to obey you and glorify you. Um, help us to help us to do that, Lord, and we pray that you would uh, bless our worship today. In Jesus' name, amen.